you don't know whether there are audience for tamil stand up comedy or not the minute you say tamil stand up comedy people's mind will go to the tv comedy i was doing corporate events and then and i came to stand up comedy so it was which ulta you need because the minute you get on stage you say something and then 50 people are laughing and you will feel like that the buttload of endorphins will get released all over your body and you will feel like you're a king or something like that you you're just redefining the dopamine yeah 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 <laughs> Hi, hi, hi. Yeah. How's it going, Jagan? Going fine so far. I had two wonderful shows yesterday and day before. Mm-hmm. So, so far, life is good. Yeah? Yep. All right. So, I think uh, a lot of people don't know about the beginning uh, and you are, you know, um, rising comedy yeah. stars, stand-up comedy in India, especially in the regional uh, yeah, I, side of it, which is Tamil. Yes. Um, how did it start? It? I mean, what, what triggered you... to do comedy by living the very good paying full time <laughs> job in IT yeah 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 where you had a chance to go around places of course not as a stand up comedian mm-hmm. but as a you know on site projector is <laughs> some sort of shit see that didn't happen that's the reason why we became a stand up joke so bad like that's where my journey started like i was working in an IT company and i used to follow stand up comedy a lot uh, when i was working there and uh, you back can in uh chennai chennai yeah. yeah i was working in chennai india so and i was in not just one company i was just juggling between companies here i worked in three it companies otherwise you'll not qualify for the it employee yeah but <laughs> ah, exactly <laughs> what 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 else is there other than like jumping companies and then hiking our own salaries and then not yeah. knowing what to do exactly. and then shifting companies again so that's yeah. the life cycle of an uh, it employee you know so that's how it started so i uh, i was working in a company and uh, I used to follow stand up comedy a lot and back then uh, there were very very less avenues there were not even like proper open mics happening in chennai so it was more like uh, okay at some point of time it will happen if at all there is a chance for me to do something like stand up comedy i'll try and pursue uh, luckily what happened was in one of the companies that i was working when i in around 2014 2015 mm-hmm. uh, so uh, what happened was a, a group of employees gathered together they started what is called as a comedy club within the within the company wow so Which company what was it it's a cognizant cognizant oh, cognizant. <laughs> cognizant yeah surprising the reason is because it was a hr initiative they encouraged it uh it's not like a very noble initiative i, I, I can <laughs> i think i can be very open the main reason for them to start it is because uh it it's very hard to bring entertainers from outside the company to come and perform for so, company events it was course selling measure exactly exactly and still getting and the still and still it's employee engagement promoting talents from in house and all those things so companies and employees yeah. if you are looking for a um, you know you your career in stand up yeah. you are in the right place yeah okay yeah yeah i i i hope so i hope so <laughs> i don't know whether the comedy club still exist though so so i don't know if it exists so that's where i started so they used to have this annual kind of uh, event mm. where they'll showcase they'll they'll have round of auditions they'll uh, ask people to come and perform be it stand up comedy or mime or so it was not thing. specific to stand up it was all over overall yeah. yeah so because mimicry and mime is the primary like it's the the bigger art form than stand up comedy back then yeah and stand up comedy was really like very very na- at a very nascent stage it was very niche A lot of people did. This was in 2015. 2015, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 2015, even in Chennai, like you can see, very handful of comedians. In India, it was at that time it was like booming. It was like crazy. Slowly, people were coming up. A lot of new comedians started coming up. The comedians who are big right now, uh, they used to be in uh, Bangalore and Mumbai and Delhi and all these places. So in Chennai, it was very very minimal at that time. So that's when I started. I I just and like I just wanted to take a shot. just while participated there and then surprisingly won uh, second place and the other two guys were like they were doing only in mimicry. open mic or no it's not an open mic so it's like the company event okay. so what they'll do is they'll just have multiple rounds they'll make you perform and uh, uh, in, in the end like you'll be performing in front of 500 employees in one location and they'll invite a chief guest uh, at that time that event they invited a guest called Mr Crazy Mohan so Crazy Mohan is a very famous playwright and a a uh, comedy writer so he's a uh, in in, uh, in tamil. tamil yeah okay. he's very famous a lot of he is he always collaborates with kamal rajini to give all the comedy films yeah oh, cool. yeah yeah he's such a big writer he's a well known figure he's a great humorist so he was the chief guest he presided over the event 
and I got prize from him. So that's when he started doing comedy. Was it a trigger point to getting no support from exactly? So that ideally, if you're writing a story, that will be the triggering point, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I like I was I was I wanted to be much more pragmatic, saying that okay, this is going to be a one-off event. So you haven't taken yourself yeah, yeah. so much seriously. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I said okay, hey, it's just an accident. It just happened. Don't take this seriously. You're still in IT. Remember your goal. You're <laughs> you some. Have to pay your you, bills. Yeah, you have to pay your bills. You have to end up getting a visa, travel on site. That should be the goal. <laughs> so that, that that's what I used to think. And then uh, uh, in the same comedy club, I met another uh, fellow stand-up comedian called Manoj Manoj Prabhakar. He's also from Chennai. So he introduced me to the open mic scene, which, which is much later. Hmm. So he said, like, come and try it in open mics. This is nothing. So only when you come to open mics and then keep grinding, the, that's when you get to know. How exactly difficult stand-up comedy is. So I didn't take that seriously. Three, four months, I started getting a lot of events within the company itself. Yeah. So that's when I realized, okay, if we are doing only within the company, it's not. I'm not going to grow. So, so what is there after the TV out? Mm -hmm. When you won mm -hmm. the event, have you got offer from within Cognizant to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many, many, many oh. events. Yeah. So uh, every time some other team will go to some team outing, there will be some conference or something like that. So as an icebreaker, they'll always want to have a stand-up comedian. Second, you know what? Yeah. A lot of the comedians, mm -hmm. they first pick when they enter into the market to, you know, they're targeting the corporate events. Yeah. And before you start your career, <laughs> you had corporate <laughs> events. Exactly. I was doing corporate events and then and I came to stand-up comedy. So it was Which ultra. is unique. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> complete, complete opposite of it. So that's that's how it basically began. You know? So then, then I started doing an open mics and then I kept doing it. Okay, so uh, that's where 2015, where you, you know, um, you realize that, okay, I can be, this is a, one of the avenue I can explore. Mm -hmm. When did you, you know, started taking it seriously and decided to switch eventually as a full-time comedian? Or in other words, before before that happens, uh, how was the reaction from your parents? I am I'm lucky in the fact that both my parents as well as my wife, they were always supportive in these kind of regards. They were not like, oh my God, you're you're an adult, don't do these kind of kiddish things, focus on your career, the monthly salary, insurance, fixed <laughs> deposits, mutual funds. So they still like that, but uh, yeah. whenever I pursue these kind of things, they were, they, I mean, like they've always been very encouraging. Right from my childhood, my uh, mother, she, she used to encourage uh, a lot of these kind of cultural activities, me participating in cultural activities. Mm -hmm. So I used to participate in school as well as... Uh, We'll have this uh, um, the colony association and all those things, you know. So they'll have this annual event. Have you done any stand up in your? No, <laughs> back then, back then, I have no idea what. I was interested in comedy. We, I always wanted to do something funny because uh, the main reason is because when you, when you're funny on stage, you'll immediately grab the attention of the audience. If if you do anything else, people will be like, okay, they'll they'll appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. But being funny is like very very good. So that that's that's always been a good part. Uh, that's always been a one part that I focused in whatever that I was doing on stage. So uh, I, I used to even participate in this kind of oratorical competitions, the, the speech and all those things. No? So even in that, I tried to like infuse humor into it. So I've always been fascinated by being funny on stage because, uh, see, I'm, I'm basically an attention seeker of you, you, if you're a stand-up comedian, you have to be an attention yes, seeker yes. without, without that, yeah, yeah, there's I no know. point. So that that is my inner sense. So and being funny was like one of the biggest plus points that you can have uh, when you're performing on stage because you immediately get the audience attention and the audience will be able to appreciate it. Imagine like that's kind of like a, I don't know if it's the right word to use, but people will say it's kind of like a drug because the minute you get on stage, you say something and then 50 people are laughing and you will feel like that a buttload of endorphins will get released all over your body and you will feel like you're a king or something like that. You're you're just redefining the dopamine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, that's uh, basically how it was. So my parents were uh, right from a very young age. They were encouraging my uh, my father. Never like he he never complained and never participated in all these things. So he used to participate in almost all the events, be it singing, dancing. So was it something came from your DNA anywhere? Like your either your mom or dad where. You know, they were a little bit, you know, had a... We are, we are living in a world where we are not supposed to believe in those kind of things. But uh, I don't know, maybe, yeah. Sometimes it, it's your parents and your family's behavior that 
you know becomes a yeah. part of your own nature no yeah, so uh, both my father said as well as mother said they are all uh, 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 like very very passionate about music hmm. um be it film music or be it classical music and everything my mother sings really well uh most of my aunts my father's sisters yeah. they sing really well and uh, right from a very young age it's like every every single aspect of my life has been associated with some song it's almost like a musical right out of bollywood so <laughs> so that's how it has been so um uh, singing and uh, these kind of cultural and fine art activities and then dressing up and then going and acting and everything so uh, it's always been a part i guess so yeah And so there was there was some connection I, to music definitely definitely yeah a very big connection to music so okay they are all very passionate music listeners so uh, i used to have a song when i was waking up when i was a kid i'm talking about my aunts will come and sing they sing like in a choir they'll come and sing to wake me up they'll come and sing to eat, make me eat food <laughs> they'll come and sing to so they'll come and sing like all now yeah. listening music yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Literally. literally yeah exactly <laughs> literally <laughs> yeah okay so cut to mm-hmm. from 2015 to when you uh, entered mm-hmm. you know the stand up comedy as a career what was the year 20 uh, so the uh, full time so i i can actually actually split it into two or three parts so the first thing is 2015 when i was doing it i was actually doing it in english yeah. because that was the norm that yeah. was like yeah. everybody was doing it in english so i made a very conscious decision of switching to tamil by 2017 which was just at that point of time uh, probably the first biggest risk that i took in stand up comedy because what tamil stand up comedy was decision? yeah I, no they were you don't know whether there are audience for tamil stand up comedy or not the minute you say tamil stand up comedy people's mind will go to the tv comedy yeah, yeah 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 so that is not going to sit well with this so that's the first decision that i took that is because the uh, but that's when a new open mic a uh, kind of hangout community started coming up was there were there open mic in chennai yeah yeah, yeah. at that time it started so yeah. uh, the earlier uh, it used to be very less hmm. there was like one group uh, which is burma bazaar conspiracy so bbc burma bazaar conspiracy yeah, also, no? they, yeah so they they used to conduct open mic very sparsely and then around 2015 2016 uh, another group called chennai comedy came out so they used to conduct open mics every week yeah. so that used to be the only open mic with respect to stand up comedy you have all arts open mic that is happening in many other places but only uh, chennai comedy was organizing stand up open mics yeah on weekdays and very specific places so that was the only avenue wherein you can go and test your material uh and then eventually in 2017 a uh, couple of other open mics started coming up one one open mic which was dedicated to tamil stand up comedians was tanglish comedy open mic so tamil yeah tamil english tamil english so they mixed it together tanglish comedy where preference was given to people who are trying to do tamil stand up comedy so when that came about i realized that okay uh, that's when i realized okay there is a great deal of audience uh, that really want to see stand up comedy being done in tamil because till then we had no idea mm. so only when that came you will not believe like open mic we always get 5 to 10 people as the audience yeah. right so tanglish comedy regularly brought in 30 people as audience which is unheard of we back then even if you get 30 people for a show it's considered to be a successful show yeah. in chennai so for open mic 25 to 30 people used to come regularly on a weekday so that's when i realized okay there is a good deal of audience here and let me try and do it in tamil i know it's risky but let me try and do it in tamil yeah. so that's the first one and the second one that i did was uh, coming out of it that's mm-hmm. the first decision that i had to make because that even that was a big decision for me because i had offers before to come out of it and then work for some media company so that i can pursue stand up comedy but i was very skeptical because the monthly salary was like the big clutch for me so i i didn't want to oh, leave that yes. at point because I, i i was already married i had two kids who were growing up oh. so yeah so all these things are there so it it looked like a very big risk for me so what i did was like uh, in 2018 uh, uh, rajiv rajaram so he's like uh, i consider him as my mentor so he uh, uh, owned this channel called put chutney which is part of a, a culture mission media a company so they they used to run all these other being indian and uh, a, a couple of other channels yeah, yeah, yeah. so um i got an offer from them saying that would you like to join our company as a creative content writer and then uh, other branding and marketing writing and all those things 
so it was for a lesser salary than what i was getting at it yeah so that's when i discussed with my wife and then my wife was at that point of time like if you're not going to take this risk now you will never be able to take it again so please take it up let's see let's figure out how it goes and then we can always this must be a turning point because yeah. getting that you know positive feedback and and push from your loved ones yeah it's very very important yeah. to get into this you know, risky exactly. careers exactly so i actually wanted to tell don't go <laughs> i i i really thought that she'll say okay don't go be in it and then keep doing stand up comedy but she was the one who pushed me into taking this job say that it's okay it's fine if it's 5k 6k less it doesn't matter we can still run our family we can somehow manage it go and try and that became one of the best decisions of my life because that's in, that's when i was able to focus on stand up comedy very seriously because it's not like your usual job where you have to like swipe your access card be there for 9 hours or anything like that yeah, yeah, yeah. they'll say that if i have a show they'll just give you the permission as long as you get the work done for the month in that company it's fine so that's how everybody used to operate because that's their all the people who are working there in that media field their aspiration is to become something like direct a movie or go and act in a yeah, movie or do these kind of shows so that happened and then in 2019 i had to like com- i uh, the company was like you know there there was a handover takeover somebody <laughs> Uh, bought the company completely and the it had to the youtube wing had to shut down yeah. so that's when i started doing full time like okay. even uh, yeah. this was not there the monthly salary was not there mm-hmm. so completely depended on stand up comedy was like 2019. 2019 not exactly completely why you so still do you, writing works in it you just bring the covid you yeah. the covid <laughs> that was the scariest time so 2019 i thought okay 2020 is going to be my year just like most of the other people and it was nobody's year unfortunately <laughs> oh all right all right okay so uh you talked about the trigger point now uh um what what were your inspiration once you entered into you know full time stand up comedy mm. who do you look up to uh meet a tamil comedian meet um, any indian hindi comedian or any global comedian so when when i started doing stand up comedy so 2015 i'm talking about so the influences predominantly will be like from the us uk and everything so for me the two big inspirations were frankie boyle and andy kaufman who are like in my opinion two ends of a comedy spectrum frankie boyle is like your typical proper stand up comedian who does jokes and andy kaufman is this uh, the weird comedian who, who uh, claims that he has never told a single joke but he's always known as a comedian so both of their acts will be completely opposite so these two guys were my biggest inspirations i wanted to do something that can be a combination of both so i wanted to be like very very transgressive and uh, uh, boundary pushing and all those things like frankie boyle and i also wanted to be very weird and absurd like andy kaufman uh, and then once i started doing more and more open mics then i started watching a lot of uh, comedians how they do it so there is no one particular inspiration i look up to a lot of people hmm. so when i uh, came in um, um one comedian that uh, that i really loved watching uh, was pravin kumar uh, yes so like i am good friends with him now back then he was like oh my god this is pravin kumar he's a star or anything like that because he was the one person that i knew that i followed who had verified handle in twitter So for me and that big deal back I, then, right? that was like a crazy now now you can buy anyone can <laughs> anyone can buy blue tick now so it, it it doesn't matter back then it was such a huge deal because this guy had a verified handle and he's a comedian and he's also from Tamil Nadu he's from Kanchipuram and I was like oh my god if he can make it so, so I, there is a remote possibility like even I can also make it so and then uh, I used to look up to him he, he was an amazing joke writer and I used to follow him a lot and then there were so many other people like uh, one of my other uh, 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 most favorite comedian was kanan gill and uh, i love watching his special because his thought process is like phenomenal i absolutely love it and the way he approaches the stuff and everything uh, and he also does it in english there is another comedian uh, who i really love watching because uh, he was vibhav setia uh, vibhav setia vibhav setia yeah, yeah, yeah. just uh, i i i just uh, i can just give him a mic and i i just want him to rant for half an hour and i can listen he, he doesn't even have to tell jokes I just love when he gets angry. Uh so there are so many people like uh, once I got into stand up comedy it's all about this. And of course there were people down south when uh, be it Arvind Desse, be it Kartik Kumar, be it Alex, all these guys because it was a very close, very small community. Neat. They all help uh help us to uh learn 
how exactly you have to approach um, everything, every show or every material that you write as a stand-up comedian, what exactly you're supposed to do. Because we used to be very close mm. back then when we were starting to do stand-up comedy. When I say we, I'm, I'm meaning my contemporaries, whoever is doing it. Yeah. We used to be very close. We'll just go and open mic, we'll just perform and then we'll come out. Yeah. If it's good, people will say it's good. If it's bad, nobody will say any word. We all will take our bike and car and then we'll move. <laughs> so that's when these guys used to come and say like, you guys are not talking to each other. You have to give feedback. That's what the other comedians do. That's what, uh, if you go and do, uh, in, Zakir Khan does the same thing. Zakir Khan need not ask feedback from anybody. That guy goes and kills for half an hour, yet he comes backstage. He asks every comedian what happened. Uh, Kesa tha, how was it? Uh, what, what, what exactly went wrong? What joke can I rework? So when, when a person like Zakir Khan is able to do it, what is stopping you from actually discussing your material with the fellow yeah. comics? So, so, so I think stand-up industry is an industry being, uh, you know, quite small compared to other entities yeah, yeah, in yeah, Tamil or Bollywood or Telugu. Yeah, yeah. I think one, one good thing Zakir also mentioned that, you know, this is a close-knit community. And uh, he being, you know, uh, mm-hmm. such a big position in the in the career, mm-hmm. he approaches to, you know, new upcoming comedians. Even if, you know, the comedian don't know him or mm-hmm. he, he feel that, oh, Sakir Khan is something big, we cannot reach him. He reach out to him and, you know, say that, you know, this was a good thing. This is where you can improve. Yeah, yeah. Is this the same ecosystem in Tamil stand-up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Pretty much, pretty much, yes. So, this is all pushed down from the top. Yeah. So, there are some comedians who will be very reserved. So, yeah. it's up to them. They'll not share elo- elaborate feedback or not. So, some comedians, when you get to know them, they'll be very particular. They'll come to you and then say that, change this. This is not working. So, that feedback mechanism, that opened a lot of things. So, uh, the minute we started doing that, now it's quite common. Back then it was not quite common. Even the biggest comedian that you have right now. So, uh, right now in Tamil Nadu, you can say the biggest comedian is Alex. So, when I do a show, Alex, uh, if Alex is there in the audience, he'll come to me and then say, hey, this material is good. You can do change this, change that. But this worked really well. This probably you can work to something else and all those things. Mm-hmm. Even without asking. Because we know that that is exactly That's what we expect. That's exactly what... We, so, I do the same thing with uh, other comedians when they ask. So, I, I used to give elaborate feedback to Arvind Desai. So, just imagine, he goes and does sold-out shows almost every week in various parts of the world. Yet, when I... I'll send him a voice message saying that, for me, this worked. For me, this didn't work. Why did you put this here? And he'll exchange the same thing. He'll, he'll also share his thoughts on what he has to do. So, at that point of time, there is no the seniority and all these things will not come into mind. Because it's mostly about how valuable your feedback is. So it's the same thing. I, I'm pretty sure that's almost like the same thing all over India. Yeah. Because there is no other choice or there is no other opportunity for us to grow or evolve. It's only purely through feedback mechanism that you can actually improve as a stand-up comedian. Because there is no like, it's, it's you don't have to go to a nets, pad up and then bat every time to improve your shots. Because nobody's going to listen to you in open mic. You need a coach. Mm. You can correct your stance, you can correct your shots and the way you're playing. In here, there is no specific coach and all. It's purely about the comedians, how one comedian exchanges with the other. So, that's basically how it works. Did your wife ever give you feedback? No, I always, I always uh, test out my new material on her first. <laughs> Anytime. Because, the I, as much as I love comics giving feedback, it's non-comics who actually listen and give you feedback their feedback is much more that valuable because yeah. that's the audience that you're targeting. The audience who are going to come to your show, they are not comics because comics will hardly laugh for jokes because they know the mechanics because of... They know the mechanics. Yeah, they know the mechanics of how the joke works. So even when I go to a show, I can I uh, most of the times I'll start laughing even before the comedian hits the punchline because I know where he's going. Uh, uh, so oh, okay. it's, it's quite obvious. I know, okay, this, when, when I hear the setup, so that's how every comic's brain works. So when the setup is there, because we are so familiar with these kind of things, so we'll know, okay, this is where the joke is going to come. Uh, but I always test out my material first on my wife. So, and then if she does not laugh, then I'll scrap it off. Because she can, she is the one person who I can make laugh so easily. Does so she give you a brutal feedback? Of course, yes. I, I, I don't expect anything less from her. I want her to be brutal because I, I she'll say that, okay, uh, I don't feel this is not right. And, or she'll say, She'll say very uh, basic feedback saying, I, I think you need to 
rethink this through. That's yeah. all she is. That's said. all we need. But but that's enough that's for me. Enough. So I'll sit down and then I'll. Sometimes she actually contributes a lot of good punchlines. Even though even some of the punchlines that I did in the show, wherein I've suffered through transitions, she helped me with that. She gave uh, very casually. She threw a punchline, and I found it to be so beautiful because I never expected. Uh, like even a comedian did not give that feedback for a long time. And she, I was suffering through the transition for four shows. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was discussing with three or four comedians. Even they were not able to help. She casually mentioned the punchline and said, hey, "You can say this and move on." No, and then why, why, why didn't you say this all along? Uh, you know the entire show. Why didn't you not? <laughs> so yeah, that I mean, like she's very supportive in that regard. She, yeah. it, it's the matter of when she, she, she sometimes does not get the time to sit down oh, and listen. Yeah, yeah, because she's also working. Yeah, but when she listens, she actually listens patiently and she. she gives feedback and it also became some sort of a superstition for me because when i test the material out on her and then i go and perform it always works well mm-hmm. so i so sometimes say sometimes blackmail her like that that's <laughs> that's a good you said yeah 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 so when you entered into full time into comedy uh how, how was your surviving mechanism when you started full time giving up your job was it a corporate gig was it a, a live comedy shows or how how what was your surviving you know techniques or how it started and how 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 was that experience like now we have established but then back in the days when you just resigned mm-hmm. and with the completely no clue as to you know how the stand up comedy as a career will turn out commercially how will i survive yeah what will be my future what was that that, that experience ah well, i was shit scared and if i'm sorry for the <laughs> pardon my friends and what not <laughs> so like i was so scared because i've never been without a monthly salary so every month uh, the the last day 31st 30th or first i'll get a salary so i uh, the first thing that i realized was that is not going to happen when i did full time and uh, it was 2019 end i was mentioning no so i was nervous i was very very nervous knowing that okay what if i don't what if i didn't get a show for an entire month what is going to be my income i don't have much savings also how much can i save so these were my uh, biggest uh, worrying points at that time because how am i going to manage my expenses because i cannot put my wife through all the burden that is like very cruel i have to support her in some way and uh, but then i we started doing live shows we started doing a uh, uh, we used to do this show called academy awards which is an annual kind of thing that's when we started 2020 so you were writing for someone speak? yeah no 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 it's a show that uh, four of us did so it's basically like uh, aib ganta awards right oh so oh, it's the know. tamil version of it okay. it's like a spin for award show then we give for movies so it's like uh, it's me uh, pravin kumar manoj and uh, mervin so of the four of us so we do this we did this show called academy awards and we know that we are we have something good in our hands <laughs> so the entire 2020 we started with that and we were so optimistic about the show because we know that the show is going to be received very well and our main idea was once the video is released all of us will go and launch our own solo show and 2020 we are going to like destroy it kill it but then uh, we did the final show final india show in march and that's when lockdown got announced and my uh, my worrying tripled quadrupled and everything that's what i was thinking because the moment you said oh. 2019 was the starting oh, year no that was a shit year for entire yes, world yes yes Twen- it's if it was 2019 beginning also i would have survived it's 29 towards the end uh, when i started doing stand up comedy full time and 2020 within just 3 months you have this lockdown coming up all the venues are closing and all my shows got cancelled i was supposed to come to australia in the march uh, that got cancelled i was uh, we were supposed to go to dubai and do the academy award show that got cancelled singapore show got cancelled so all these things are cancelling one by one by one and um, that's when i was sitting there i really started panicking i talked to my wife and then i really asked can i go for a job so i don't know what i'm going to do i don't know what exactly is going to happen i thought i'll do stand up comedy full time but if this is going to be the case i cannot do it so she said don't be in a hurry wait to 3 months at least you just wait and you see what is going to happen and luckily something like that happened so that's when zoom shows started yes. happening we hated zoom shows <laughs> but there is no other choice for me i loved zoom shows because it's painful it's irritating uh, but you had to do it so luckily i got one corporate gig like that uh, that uh, like uh, gave me the 
biggest cushion. So it is one of the worst experiences that any comedian can have because I had to do shows continuously for 10 days in Zoom, morning and evening. That was a corporate gig corporate on gig. Zoom. Yes, corporate gig on Zoom. Day one. What was the audience size? 300 on Zoom. Each. 200, 300 will vary. Okay. So they, it's a, it's a company that was doing this show for all its employees all over India. Uh, I can't mention the company name, obviously. So they were doing it all over India. So they scheduled it in such a way. They wanted to do it in such an elaborate way. So 10 days we had to do this. And I will get up in the morning. The morning show will be at 9. 9 to 10 I have to do it. And then I'll be exhausted. I'll have to take care of my kids, clean vessels, cook, sweep and everything. Then evening, 7 o'clock it will start again. 7 to 8. And I'll feel shit because you will never get the same kind of response in every show. Sometimes the morning show will go well. The evening show will be like so crap because nobody will be listening yeah it's zoom you cannot gauge the reaction of the audience so this was like a big burden and i used to do countdowns and all okay day one completed okay nine more days to go okay eight more days to go but i got paid a very hefty sum for doing that and uh, that put me through the lockdown and slowly other sort of gigs started coming up which helped me so uh, because the online consumption was there and we also started doing uh, some reaction videos and everything yeah, yeah, yeah. because we had to like put out something because of that we were able to uh, uh, do some sort of promo for online shows yeah, and everything yeah, yeah. and I also got into web series writing at that time I wrote a web series called Meme Boys for Sony Life so I was one of the principal writers and I was able to do that uh, okay yeah. what is the name? Meme Boys Meme, Meme Boys it's a okay. Tamil web series Tamil yeah I wrote that and then I also uh, yeah that's when all these kind of things writing gigs and other gigs started opening up and uh, yeah, luckily, that's how I survived after a particular point of view. So I think you had a, that, that Zoom course, the corporate gig was the, you know, breakthrough experience yeah, for yeah. you, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is a completely unconventional. Yeah. So how did you manage, you know, or how did you get the reactions? The Zoom call being your first proper corporate gig where you don't have a real conventional way to get the people's reaction and everything. The, the reason I'm asking is, you know, Comedy scene in India is is quite young because, you know, comedy across the world started 100 years before we even think of because of, you know, we being under British rule. We were, we have been told that, you know, Indians are humorously serious versus Britons are seriously humorous. So once post-independence, we got, you know, slowly the Bollywood started, the entertainment pick up. Uh, comedy still was a side gig uh, you know 10 singers are singing when they are tired you are there to do some sort of mimicry yeah. and you you put your mark yeah. then eventually scene changed uh, the laughter show came on Sony which yeah. is yeah, yeah. To around 2005 six, Kidding. which changed the complete landscape ecosystem of you know uh, comedy and it's, it's, it's uh, consumption <laughs> and eventually you know stand up comedy yeah. uh, took its way in India yeah so you know how was your surviving techniques on you know okay this sad lands very didn't land very well mm. this sad didn't land well yeah. uh, what is what is your technique or how do you uh, you know keep improving yourself what is your mechanism same thing like uh, it's first of all uh, at the starting stage, like what you said, it, it's more about finding the grammar for uh, Tamil stand-up comedy. So, uh, just like every language has their own culture for humor. Lingo. Lingo. So, we had uh, uh, this format called Patti Mandram, which is basically... Patti? Patti Mandram. Patti Mandram. Patti Mandram. Uh, it's, like, it's kind of like a debate wherein you will have a set of three speakers uh, belonging to two teams and then there will be a topic, there will be a, a like moderator or you call, it, um, call them as judge however you want to call it so they'll be holding it it's it'll be some generic mundane topic that we all uh, you know like get in school and everything so that used to be the bigger source of humor for uh, tamil people so party okay. Vandram, yeah party Vandram is it's an annual convention if you just switch on the tv during uh, festivals like diwali or uh, pongal or everything like that so is it like a banter it's not a banter so it's 
basically uh, a debate. So yeah, okay. uh, you will, there'll be a speaker who will come and talk. But the idea behind Patti Mandram is why people watch Patti Mandram is it's not about the point; it's about how funny they are. Okay. So that always makes uh, uh, the sells so the was, okay. entire show. So even the the monitor, the moderator, the judge, they'll also be very funny. And uh, there are quite a few famous uh, people doing that. And um, that was the base. So we had to take inspiration from that. Because there were no really, they, there was not a lot of material for us to take guidance from. For doing Tamil stand-up comedy, the first yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. So we had to take that grammar and we had to infuse the stand-up comedy grammar that we knew already. And then we do it. We kept repeating it again and again and again in open mics first. So then what happened was, uh, very surprisingly, because we always thought that corporate gigs, they'll prefer English stand-up comedy mm. because of HR policy and everything. But uh, eventually, they understood that, okay, 90% of the people working in Chennai, in some of, most of the companies, they understand, they know Tamil. And the other rest of the 10%, they can understand Tamil, it's just that they're not that fluent with it. So why bother with English stand-up comedy that, like many people might not be that is very quite comfortable. funny that that was a HR policy yeah. to have an English stand of comedy yeah. only yeah, yeah yeah what kind of shit policy yeah like? exactly exactly because like uh, uh, from they will come from the point of view okay uh, if we do Tamil stand up comedy if other oh, employees oh, come like, like that multiple yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay. they but eventually that didn't uh, matter actually to the yeah. audience even the other people started enjoying it because they were able to understand the context of what exactly is happening because when I go and perform in an IT company because I'm also, I also worked in an IT company I do this all this IT jokes and I don't really have to like say it properly in English for them to get it they understand yeah. what I'm talking about all these things and it's a Tanglish style that I mix and do it yeah, yeah. so when I uh, realized that that also helped me grow because as a stand-up comedian you have to hate corporate shows that's like given but uh, I don't hate corporate shows because yeah. uh, that's when I, uh, only because I performed a lot of corporate shows, I grew up as a comedian. I evolved as a comedian because testing your material in that kind of a crowd, a closed crowd, and if they react positively, that is going to work uh, in front of public audience just like this. But then how do you manage the, you know, corporate shows have... Mm -hmm. hundreds of red carpets. Yeah. You can't do this, you can't do this. Yeah, can't yeah. This. And... Uh, just you know out of uh nowhere if if someone who is the chief guest could be politician or anything and you have decided certain sets in your mind yeah. which is completely opposite to the yeah. chief guest sitting there how do you that's the growth the no, that, that that's that's how you grow that's you have to adapt according to the situation because you have to adapt according to the crowd some crowds will respond sometimes it's the guest that is going to be the problem what will, what i will do is uh, when I do IT-based stand-up comedy or even corporate stand-up comedy or anything for that matter, uh, even if I don't involve like this social topics or uh, general politics and everything. Yeah. So, um, uh, I, I talk about even, um, it's when I talk about, when I make fun of managers or when I, when I make fun of some senior officials, some of the people get offended actually. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it was it any any? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it happened. With it happened. It happened. I'm sure they get offended. It, it happened. It happened. I got a feedback, elaborate feedback, saying that uh, no, this was not appropriate. Whatever that you did was not appropriate. We didn't expect this from you. Uh, this is uh, you insulted the uh, some person on all those things. So at that point of time, you'll be like very careless. Nah, come on, this bullshit. Nobody cares about it. Yeah. But then I eventually realized that, okay, maybe what if I change some of the wordings? What if I change the way I presented the stuff? So it helped me grow. Because the more I got exposed to that kind of crowd, especially hostile crowd, because most of the corporate gigs, these guys will be hostile and judgmental. Mm. So they'll be like, okay, uh, okay, try to make me laugh. I'll not, I'll, I'm not going to laugh. You try to make me laugh. Yeah. Let's see if you can do it. Yeah. It's as though like they'll have a chip on the shoulder. They'll come and they'll be in an attacking <laughs> mode, no? So uh, for me, those kind of challenges when it presented itself, I wanted to take them head on, even though I was nervous, because I wanted to do that. When I go and crack that, uh, that is that gave me a lot of experience doing that kind of shows. Because then when I come to public show, it was like cakewalk for me. Oh, these yeah. guys, okay, these guys are coming here to enjoy. I can manage this crowd because I've seen crowd that is worse than this. So, so did, did you did you ever feel that uh, you know stand up comedy? Uh, is you know mainly about how you're presenting the social economic issues mm -hmm. in your own way, but then you know the curse words mm -hmm. are part and 
culture of you know our our routine when you're talking to your friends did you ever do you use curse words in your stand up comedy or do you do you feel the need of it very sparsely but yeah sometimes you need to use that no see it's not like uh, we have this image especially with respect to indian comedy or i i i even i can even say even tamil comedy no so they'll say this clean comedy tag yeah. so they'll always associate with it because that is considered to be very beautiful for some reason yeah we all use cuss words we all use swear words in our, our daily life and it's quite common we all know it but for some reason we put this clean tag towards comedy because that is considered to be very special so i do do that for me it's about like it's, there is nothing wrong in using it but the context of using it matters the most so i don't believe in clean comedy so it's it's either funny or it's not that's all sometimes when you're registering your frustration a bad word helps yeah a cuss word helps because that's how i register my frustration if you want to use like fuck you have to use fuck you cannot like you cannot say like oh fudge it does, that doesn't make any it sense make any so sense. you have to use it because if that's that's how you're going to use it in your real life what is the point in like not doing that uh when you're actually doing the set yeah. when you're actually right not to be set. real yeah but in in corporate setup that's the irritating part you cannot do exactly the same thing yes. they specifically ask you not to do political stuff they specifically ask you they not give to give you the list yeah, yeah yeah of course that's because uh i used to hate that when people said that but i understood why it's the hr it's their job that is on the line yeah the audience will enjoy the audience they are also very politically sound they have knowledge they they do entertain these kind of topics and of course uh there are hell a lot of memes circulating around politics almost every day that you come through that makes fun of all the politicians all the big leaders yeah. so it's not new with respect to comedy all the people will enjoy but it's just even if it's one complaint that comes from somebody the hr's job is good their job will be on that just doing that job. so they they will be very strict about it so it's just a matter of empathy i understand why they had to do it but it's fine but in public show it doesn't matter at all public yeah. show like you have to advertise it properly if it's an 18 plus show it will be an 18 plus show there is no question about it if you are bringing kids to an 18 plus show that's your fault that's your fault <laughs> it's yeah. not the comedian's fault yeah, yeah. i need to need to say yeah, yeah, yeah and we have seen i mean like uh, russell peter show kid this there and then he'll make fun of that and all no so it's quite common as long as you have an understanding of what exactly the show is it's fine and i don't yeah I, the cuss words or swear words everything is part of uh, comedy it's about being funny it's about making funny sometimes seeing somebody losing their shit is so funny right so and they lose their shit because they lose their shit using cuss words using swear words and if you are a person in real life where you don't use it at all at any point of time then i understand so why you do you, do you predecide your or do you write your uh, uh, your sets or or in in other words uh, so comedy comes from either your own personal experiences or you observe people a lot <laughs> or something you completely you know write it being a professor script writer mm-hmm. you know these are the three major avenues yeah yeah so what is what is your your uh, you know your source of comedy writing could uh, be hybrid and so yeah so uh, the third one is something that i don't believe in at all uh, which is like just pure joke writing that's okay uh, mm-hmm. that used to be the case i can say that 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 used to help a lot of comedians back in the 70s and 80s in us yeah. because these guys used to write for talk shows sitcoms and everything so you have to be a good joke writer it doesn't matter because joke writing is it's also very common here so it's basically you say something and i have to give a counter that's it that's joke writing that's that's how it used to work that it's one liners and everything yeah. so i think it has evolved from that now now if you see all the western even uh, 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 here australia or uh, uk they've evolved it to such a level that they've created a uh, they've uh, transformed a comedy into a different kind of art form where it's almost theatrical no most of the shows has uh, become a much more theatrical it's not just a person standing in a mic and then delivering jokes they are evolving so for me uh, earlier when i did a show i used to do it we used to do it as a double act i and mermin the other guy so that was completely observations hmm. so observations on uh, i used to do on tamil music and he used to do it on everything else about tamil cinema it's purely observation like and uh, how this music director is able to do this kind of songs mm. how this guy inspired this kind of songs what what will happen if uh, he did this thing so it's all observation so we we know that okay this is what they are doing in this song we used to tell that the show that i'm doing right now 
is much more personal it's stories from my life the entire show re- uh, show is about stories from my life and it's about how i take it and i consider that to be much more real because uh, there is no nobody can judge or there is no scale or there is no measurement as to uh, what exactly this is because it's purely personal it's yours and it will be original if it happened in your life that's original there's still observational humor here and there uh, that i'll just throw it away because as as a comedian you have to do that but personal experience is where i'm moving in right now because i would like i always like to tell stories i always like to share my personal experiences and i always like to find uh, uh you know like some kind of catharsis through art so mm-hmm. something that i went through in my life and i need to have that maturity to transform some of the hard things that painful things mm-hmm. that happen in my life i i wanted to like channelize it through this i still can't do most of the stuff so there are a lot lot of other painful stuff that happen in my life that i still cannot channelize but i just wanted to start at some point of time so this show is basically that most of the stories that i share in the uh, in this uh, show uh, when it happened in my real life it was not funny it is i could uh, in the show yesterday i could even though uh, completely naive to tamil yeah. as a language yeah. i could relate many of the references you took like this kids or could facebook yeah. low marriage arrange marriage yeah. so those are the things which i could relate for you know i could try to connect the dots here and there yeah. but i can relate that you know this is coming from a proper neat mm. story yeah. from your 90s and you know the your teenage and everything so you are able to pick those things up say so, so anybody can write on those topic like what you said that's the, 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 that was the question right so you take or could i okay uh, write a set on or could it's basically an assignment so but what i shared with respect to or could is something that happened with my life so it's the same thing but it's it happened to me so that makes it what unique so anybody can write about our code but what happened when you put yourself in that situation what happened in your life and what exactly you did so that completely changes the entire setup yes. that makes it much more original because i don't have to like take jokes i don't have to be worried about okay okay did some other comedian write this joke okay did some other comedian write this punchline yeah. because it, the punchlines vanish at that point of time you try to be funny because something funny happened you look back at it and it, now it's funny it's just a retrospective of your entire life you know so back then i don't know how you would have taken but right now when i look at it i found it funny so i took incidents like that so that and then i threw it out so i i want to be able to do more of that stuff mm-hmm. uh, going forward uh, so it's all about evolution but when you when i started out as a comedian it's observational stuff that i was interested in i go i point out i take uh, very mundane topics traffic signals food uh, topics yeah yeah that is like the biggest exercise a comedian can have lot of people what what will happen is like including me i'm not negating myself when i got into comedy i wanted to be like this guy who i want i wanted to be very serious i want to be like uh, a, a long form storyteller like probably billy conley or uh, a pat nosworth i wanted to be like these guys these guys are discussing complex topics and but nobody will listen to you <laughs> <laughs> when you're coming up when you're coming up and talking about all these things nobody will listen to you because like i don't even know who you are i don't even know uh, how funny you are i don't even know what you're trying to say so how, how am i able to what gives me what sh- how much should i invest in you to actually listen to you yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, when you're starting out when i started out uh, that's when somebody gave me an advice saying do observational comedy for stick simple stuffs uh, from your own life or from somebody else then like try to read jokes on it. It, it for all of us something like that would have happened everybody would have gone to gym at some point of time mm. everybody would have traveled in an aeroplane at some point of time the relatable or train the... yeah yeah so everybody can relate to it make simple observational jokes through that so that's how we started it and that's the reason why my first show was full of observational jokes uh, but i just made it pop cultureish that's all rather than like general like so i just made it pop cultureish because pop culture tamil sells a lot mm-hmm. so that gave me the visibility yeah, yeah. that you have right now so and then like once that is done even now people are asking for the same thing some of the people who came to the show they'll ask like why didn't you talk about this music director and that music director but that's the call that you have to make so i say that okay that chapter is over now i'm trying to do something different oh. so let's you see what what is going to happen here then we'll see how it goes forward so like i don't know what holds maybe like what you said socio economic issues and political issues that that will happen eventually at some point of time yeah, yeah, yeah. that is when i have to grow up as a comedian i have to be in a very good state of mind i have to have enough uh, good dearth of experience to even address those topics and uh, life experience do, do, do you feel some sort of reservation or fear that you know 
doing touching religion mm-hmm. or political are the dangerous to you know individual's career mm-hmm. we have examples yeah. do you do you, do you do you ever feel those those reservations when uh, when you are writing your jokes mm-hmm. when when you writing your sets yeah um not while writing or not even while performing it's because when i get on stage and say stuff that's when i'm the most fearless it's when i get off stage that's when the fear and other things start hitting you because on stage it's like okay it's my zone. it's a comfort zone okay i am in my place this is the place that i know so there's no fear but only when you get off stage all these kind of thought will come but then again um i think when you are going into that kind of territory uh losing your career and everything so it it's always about how you do it, how <laughs> clearly you address these kind of issue i don't want to be controversial just for controversy sake so there is no point this is no point okay if if i'm going to do this i'm going to get a lot of attention i'm going to do get a lot of followers there is no point in me doing that kind i think that phase is over now yeah, people have tried it yeah, it's yeah. it's pointless no? yeah i uh, see all i have to do is just to be famous if i have to be famous all i have to do is just attack two top tamil stars or two south indian stars or a top politician from tamil nadu they are going to like make me famous overnight but what is the point of it that's when you lose your career and everything i don't want to do that when i do that i want to take something if even if i'm addressing politics or even if i'm addressing some sort of social issue i have to take it from my own experience i have to have a little bit of life experience to view it from a lens so that i can present it neatly and if that is going to get controversial i don't mind because i i stand by what i said See, even some of the pop culture stuff that i did they were controversial i i did get uh, when when i did that academy awards uh, thing so one of the portions which my portions from the show that got shared that became viral and that uh, got me a lot of brick bats and uh, yeah 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 any personal message yeah 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 so many so many and people started like uh, doing uh, sending all this uh, direct messages abusing and everything so a lot of those things started happening but i didn't mind because i know okay uh, i know you're very you, short you, uh, were you expecting those uh, not for not for my part of the show that's the that's the funniest thing so four of us did there was another comedian called mervin his portion uh, we thought was the most controversial but that portion didn't get shared somebody took out my portion from the show and then they started sharing it in facebook it went viral overnight and then morning i started getting all these messages i didn't know what was happening it was lockdown time just imagine we just be in the show but you suddenly in getting all this message i don't know where i'm getting it but but, but you were sure uh, since this lockdown now nobody's going to get my yeah <laughs> yeah so that was that's the biggest advantage that i had but uh, that was a learning experience when i did that yeah. and that became viral and when people started abusing and all this thing i don't mind because i know what i said uh, it's not fake it's yeah. yeah it happened the reason why people are laughing at it because there is some sort of truth to it and i it, i don't mean it as an insult to the person the artist concerned or whatever it is it's just that even the greatest artists fail at some point of time and you pinpoint that failure and there's nothing wrong in it even they will be able to acknowledge it everybody makes fun of themselves so uh, i don't mind it so it, this is just cinema i'm talking about imagine if you expand this to politics then the level of oh. abuse that you're going to get is going to be very bigger so i need to have the mental maturity first of all to handle all those things but i think uh, certain part mm-hmm. the cinema is as equal to oh know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah worship yeah. the actors yeah yeah, yeah. so you, if you're offending you know any yeah. star forget super mega whatever <laughs> the prefix suffix they add the moment you True. offend star True. the people will start queuing up in yeah, your house exactly so there is a very thin line between what is politics and what is cinema Yeah. when it comes to south no so it's very 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 thin because most of the actors are almost like politicians they have this religion legion of followers uh who are very passionate about it um and they have uh, temples but, yeah 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 they do they do they do they do, they do have temples they have like associations they have like elaborate uh, uh you know committees and meetings and all those things so if you even say something very bad about them or their fans they will have uh, they have enough resources to come and abuse you 24/7 the same thing happened to uh, another comedian called manoj when we did the previous version of akanam awards he offended a star uh, not in tamil but telugu and uh, what happened was like uh, uh, these guys the fans of the star 
uh, they had shifts okay so morning 9 to 5 the indian fans will start abusing and then uh, from evening 6 they'll send message to the people who are there in us and uk and they'll take over so in midnight also they'll send a message they have all set offshore model <laughs> Yeah. For for abusing a random comedian who had no following, and these guys started abusing, and he became famous because of that, and he became very con. That became a very big issue. So those kind of things used to happen, and this is just cinema that we are talking about. So the idea is like for me, I have to be very sane. I have to be very clear because once I'm very confident about what I'm saying, okay, this is what I'm going to say. There is no lie about it. There is no truth about it. I was not being offensive. I was not being insulting. I just stated a fact. I just called a spade a spade. So I, if I'm doing that, then I'll not be, I'll not have that fear of, okay, whatever that you're going to do, you know, I don't mind. So, yeah, yeah. but if it crosses a particular line, and I know that I'm crossing a particular line, uh, I have to be very aware of why I said that, and then I have to have, uh, as I said, you need the to limit your mental maturity to, okay, I said this, I know it's controversial, I crossed the line, but I crossed the line because for this reason. That kind of maturity I need to have. Otherwise, I'll not be able to push myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so you are doing the global tour. Yeah. Australia, you had uh, before Sydney yesterday, you had uh, Canberra. Canberra. Yeah. Sydney, now you're going to? New Zealand. Brisbane. And New Zealand, New Zealand. New Zealand. Yeah. New Zealand. Uh, what is in the future pipelines? What are the other countries? Yeah, if, so, so countries apart from India will, uh, so far, I think uh, it's Malaysia. And uh, Dubai and then London, mm -hmm. uh, UK. Uh, I just uh, because in the previous round I finished Singapore already, so these three countries are still there. And New Zealand is of course uh, I, I yet to do it. And uh, of course I have shows all over uh, India right now, and some of the other cities I have to plan it yet. And um, yeah, as of now, that's where I'm taking my show, and I don't know what uh, the future holds after that. We yeah. have to see. Hopefully. US or something like that if happens it will be great or uh, we'll see I, I don't have uh, uh, I don't think my hopes on to anything like that yeah, yeah, yeah. as as much as it happens it's because when you keep doing shows that's when you get all this kind of opportunity because when I started this I didn't know whether I was going to come to Australia or not hmm. so I didn't even think about it so once the show started getting good reception everywhere I just want to take it to as many places as possible where people can appreciate it so because that's when I get to learn i get to wall i get to grow yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's not if i'm if i'm doing it in the same place if i'm just doing it in chennai bangalore coimbatore again and again and again mm. i know okay so i know these guys are going to enjoy these guys have already enjoyed it i'm doing it to new people but when i take it to people of different age groups because even i i can see the difference in the audience between canberra and sydney okay in just 300 kilometers just imagine if i'm taking it to like new zealand or london or malaysia how these guys are going to respond. So that's going to add a lot of value to it. So my plan is to take it to as many cities as possible, as many countries as possible. Uh, I think thing. one thing I, I, I must say that, you know, being a non-Tamil, uh -huh. I could relate to a lot of the steps. Yeah. I could laugh on people's laugh. Ah, okay. So I think that's a, that's a biggest thing, guys. Uh, nice guys. Being even non-Tamil can, can yes. this guy can make us, make me laugh. <laughs> Definitely, you're gonna crack it up yes. and bit, and and this show is check out his shows, check yeah. out his YouTube, uh, <laughs> Malaysia, London, Dubai, London, London, Dubai, go there, watch out, <laughs> and he's killing it everywhere. Oh, thank so, you. Thank please, you so please, much. please, please go and watch the shows. Thank you, and thank you so much, Jagan. Pleasure is mine, absolutely. It was a just one day notice, and you have given us come on. precious time. No, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. <laughs>